Hello, humans. Nothing is quite right today. I spent the weekend screaming and crying and shouting. And I have no voice. And the paradoxical thing about that is I lost my voice finding it, if that makes sense. And if it doesn't, that's okay. I'm here in front of this camera right now because I said I wanted to learn how to give a talk and how to talk to people and share messages that are important to me without a guest, without somebody to fall back on. And so although nothing's perfect, although we could tinker with the lights, we could tinker with the video, we could tinker with the makeup making me less red or my hair, we could get a haircut, we're just going to do it. We're going to do it broken voice, broken hair, imperf imperfect. I'm never ready. There's always some amazing excuse why I'm not doing it. So we're just going to do it anyway. I feel silly, but I think I would feel even sillier if I didn't do it. I told my friends and my loved ones and my support group and my patrons that I wanted to learn how to deliver a talk, that I wanted to learn how to communicate alone without a guest on a stage. And so here we are. We're on a stage. I am alone. I have written something to say, and I'm going to say it. Thank you for being witness to this moment of me learning this skill. This is talk number two <laughs> called magic. Magic is a bit of a nerve-wracking topic for me. I love it. It's something that plays a role in my life, but I'm ashamed of it on some level. I think I would much rather be talking about something in the material world, something like psychology or neuroscience or something, you know, the tangible that I could get everybody and those cool, cynical skeptics on board with me. But that's not what today's video is about. Today's talk is about magic. And I'll start by clearing something up. I'm not going to be talking about casting spells on each other, at least not the kind that you see in movies or on video games. I'm not going to be talking about, you know, sacrifices or voodoo or any of that. I'm going to be talking about some kind of magic that I really, truly believe is here with us right now and that I am a part of. I believe I am a magical being. I don't know about you, but I believe you're a magical being too. And you could join me in that belief if you wanted to. My book club, or I should say our book club, the How To Human Book Club, we've been reading a book by an African shaman named Maladoma Somme, and his people referred to his magic as what knowledge could not eat, and that line stuck with me. That got me really good because it was just perfect. Magic is what knowledge can't eat. E. It's what knowledge can't take away. And I think about some of the magical experience that I've felt in this world, a lot of which have to do with holiness and spirituality and divinity. Churches have felt magical to me. Congregations have felt magical to me. Some therapeutic moments have felt magical to me. And that way of looking at it, that the magic is what knowledge can't take away from it, is just perfect. And I welcome you to adopt that belief. Now, in my spiritual tradition, the one I grew up with, now I'm not necessarily a member of it now, but in the Western Christian tradition, that tradition has spent a lot of time and energy kind of afraid, A, of its own magic, of people discovering that magic for themselves, and also that knowledge could hurt that magic. But what they had all along, what they were really offering people, that congregation, that holy moment of coming together, of worshiping together, of helping one another, when somebody has a spiritual experience, when somebody feels the love of God, the love of their community, you could tell them exactly how that works. You could tell them the hormones that are pumping through their veins. You could tell them what neurons are firing. You could tell them what exactly has led to that moment, and it will still be just as holy. So I want you to think about that as we talk about magic. What are the things in your life so mystical, so magical, so powerful that knowledge can't impact them, because I'm going to ask you to lean into that. Many of you know, if you've been listening to my show for any period of time, that when I first got sober, I just ended up a hardcore atheist. It's just what felt safe to me at the time. I think I had spent so much time delirious and on drugs that just, you know, sticking just to the material was what felt safe. And that's what I did. I was an atheist. I was a hardcore materialist. I was probably a nihilist. I was all the ists you could think of. But what happened was after four years of living like that, I noticed that the people who had gotten sober with me at the same time period who are viewing life through a greater lens, people who had a higher power, people who were looking for omens, people who were making ritual, who were embracing their mystical wonderfulness, 
they were just doing better than me. And so that's honestly why I started even trying to get spiritual in the first place. So here we go. Here's my first definition. A magical person is someone who has learned to work in the mystery of life. Somebody who is unafraid of the mystical. Somebody who courageously takes on the possible. And possible is the key word. Because a lot of us know right away what's impossible. World peace is impossible. Your community being a safe and loving place where nobody honks at each other. The morning traffic is impossible. Maybe not. My community is pretty good with driving. But let's just focus on that. That So many of us know exactly what's impossible. Well, my first piece of advice to you is whenever you see a young wizard or witch playing with a wand, don't you ever, ever take that wand away. Because that little child... That little witch or wizard knows so much more about what's possible than we do. I remember being a little kid and hearing about the world crises happening. I remember feeling like, well, get me the UN. Put Bill Clinton on the phone. I want to talk to him. Because I remembered what was true. Kids remember. We're here to help each other. And this week, I was tasked to do a random act of kindness, which is a lot harder than you might imagine. I if you're listening to this right now, I task you with doing a random act of kindness for somebody that you don't know. It's kind of hard. My plan was I'm going to go out, I'm going to clip a rose from the garden, I'm going to find somebody who looks just amazing, just fabulous, you know, just their spirit is bursting from their chest, and I want to say, you are contagiously wonderful. I want to give you this rose. However, there's no roses in the garden. Whoops. So I went to a cafe. And then my plan was, you know, we're all busy at the cafe. We're all trying to get our coffee. It's a work day. Everyone's got something to do. I'm just going to treat the person behind me to whatever they wanted to get that day. So that's what I did. And, of course, what happens is this person comes up behind me. They're on their phone. They're just really in there. I mean, their phone is right in their face. And I'm waiting. I'm kind of like tentatively waiting. Like, come on, look up. I want to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something really cool. Just come on, just look up. Just look up. I'm going to tell you. They didn't look up. They literally didn't. They, you know, as the line moved, they moved in their phone. Like it was like a perfect, they were, they were uh, locked in place. I could not get their attention. So what finally ended up happening is I get to the front of the line. I get to the cashier and I say, hey, I want to treat this person behind me to whatever they want. So I'm going to leave my credit card behind for a second. And I'll come get it afterwards. He goes, okay, perfect. And I, I hear him explain what's going on to the person behind me. I see her smile. And she kind of walks over to me like, ah, oh, what made you do that? What, what is this all about? And I told her, I got tasked to do a random act of kindness. And you're the person who I wanted to do it to. And we had a great conversation, a little, little connection, a moment that wouldn't have happened otherwise. It was beautiful. And that's a great analogy. That's kind of what we're all doing in a way. We're all on our phones. We're all scrolling and searching and looking. What do you think we're looking for on there? What we're looking for is right in front of us. It's the people in front of us. It's our communities. It's our friends. It's our family. We're not going to find what we're looking for on those phones. We're going to find what we're looking for by looking up, by seeing what's around, by imagining what's possible, by getting a little magical. Speaking of magic, you are magic. You are sea mud that decided to be conscious a couple billion years ago. What do you think the mud and the dirt came alive for? What do you think it evolved for? What do you think you were born for? You think you were born to just survive, just to claw and fight and fuck your way through life? Just to die again and become unconscious again? You think that's it? I think non-existence would be a lot easier than that. So why do you think it came alive? I can tell you why I think it came alive. I think it came alive. I think the earth decided to become conscious to experience itself, to love itself, to get to play a part in itself. I believe we're here right now so we can be together, so we can experience each other, so we can create together, so we can belong to each other, so that we can love each other. I really think that's why we're here. We do have to eat, and we do have to fuck, and we do have to fight sometimes. But I think more so than all of those, we are here to love each other. And we need a lot more love than we're putting out right now.
So we have this, this little group of ragtag individuals. We call it the How to Human Book Club. When we're not really gathered around a book, I call it the Human Hangout. We meet once a week on Mondays. I welcome you to come join our Patreon. It's there. But anyway, I get this idea. And so I, I text everybody uh, on the Patreon and I say, all right, we're doing something a little differently this week. What's going to happen is we're going to get assigned someone that we don't know in this group very well. And so I had everybody sit there before we did that, before we paired off, I had them close their eyes and I had them say, what's one thing you could do this week that you'd be really proud you did? What's one thing you could really use a little help doing? Is it exercising every day? Working out? Eating a little healthier? Meditating? Journaling? Connecting with the universe? What's that one thing? And then I paired everybody off with somebody that they didn't know very well. And then I said, your job is to help that person you don't know very well get that one thing done every single day. That's your job. You're going to be that person's person. You are assigned to that person. You are there to be there for that person. You are there to support that person. And you're going to make sure as best as you can that they get that one thing done. Now, how do you think it felt this week? We're about halfway through. I've been doing it for three nights. How do you think it feels to have somebody you don't know very well checking in with you, making sure that you're doing your thing, that you're doing that one thing that you predetermined would make your week a success and checking in, hey, how are you doing? It's 6 p.m. This is a time you best thought it was to check in with yourself and meditate. Have you started to make time to meditate today? Can you imagine how good it will feel if you do that? You told me that's what you wanted to do this week. Let's do it. It feels pretty good feels pretty good because that's what we're here to do. We're here to be here for each other. But our world is not set up for that. Our world is set up for us to go do our own things, worry about ourselves, get our own nuclear families and lives together. You know, I'll get mine and fuck everybody else, right? That's what we're doing. I got told I was playing a small game, and I was. My game was how does Sam heal? How does Sam get better? How does Sam have the best life possible? How does Sam make more money? How does Sam build this thing? How does Sam get these fucking listeners to share the podcast they all listen to? I can see they're listening. Why aren't they sharing it? And that was a small game. It was all I, 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 I. And I know why. I have had so many moments of pain and anguish and torment and struggle I know exactly why I'm so concerned with making sure I'm safe and protected. It's totally clear to me. But what I don't know is why I wasn't thinking about other people and their pain and their anguish and their suffering and how while I'm suffering, maybe I can also help them suffer a little less. I got a chance to see about 30 people who I have never met before this weekend 12 hours a day, five days, grieve and wail and melt into the floor and become puddles and hit the fetal position. They were grieving all kinds of things. Everybody's holding on to a lot of stuff. Everybody's had a really full life. There's a lot of pain in it. They're grieving their parents, not loving them the way they wish, their parents not making time for them, the times they betrayed themselves, the times they betrayed their lovers, the times their innocence was stolen by monsters and rapists. And I'm watching these people, watching a whole room full of people just in tears, just sobbing and wailing and grieving. I saw how lonely we all are, because this was a great cross-section of any population, all different ages, all different ethnicities, all different backgrounds. Everybody's so lonely. Everybody's so tired of doing this thing alone. That's all of us. And then I saw that same 30 people help each other get back to their feet. I saw them stand really tall. And the spirit come back into them and their life force come back into them. I saw them go from, fuck you, I hate you, I can't believe you did that to me, mom. I can't believe you did that to me, dad. I can't believe you did that to me. So I am not a victim anymore. 
And I am done carrying this around. I am done being small. I am done holding back. I'm ready to just be who I'm supposed to be. And this story I've been using to stay small, to stay safe, to stay hidden, to really protect my little nuclear life, I'm done with that story. I want to try something bigger. I want to try something scarier. I want to risk getting hurt again. I want to try giving love another chance. I want to try giving my dreams another chance. I witness the pain of the world in these 30 strangers, and I witness what's possible when 30 strangers come together and start working for each other, just for a weekend. I mean, we've been checking in on each other since, but I'm going to end this talk with a story from my own life that I've experienced since then because I had, a, I had an amazing takeaway from this, which is that, you know, I give and I give and I give, and, you know, sometimes it's really altruistic and sometimes it's because I secretly want something in return, but I, I don't really have a problem giving so much, although I have felt my heart just crack open and my capacity to love get a lot bigger. The point is, is that I got this great reminder that I could pull people in, that I could enroll people into my vision for the world, one of which is to build a beautiful, safe community. And if you're not already creating one, join ours. You know, Join ours. You could join for 50 bucks a month or 50 cents a month, excuse me, or 50 bucks a month. Fuck it. Uh, whatever it feels right, you could join. It's not about the money, uh, but it is You know, just how you join. So anyway, on to my story. I have this big, scary vision. I have this vision that by the end of 33, of being 33 years old, I will be able to bench press 225 pounds. Why that weight? It's more weight than I've ever done. It's more weight than I could do when I was on steroids. It's more weight than I could do when I was younger and stronger. And between tearing my rotator cuff and COVID, I've lost a lot of strength. And that just seems like a big juicy goal to work towards. However, there's one problem. And that problem is I've been stuck at 165 pounds. I go to the bench, I sit down, I lock on 165 pounds and I lift it. And I can't even imagine putting two and a half more pounds on either side. I can't imagine adding another five pounds. So I had this problem, which is I've been stuck. And all of a sudden, my dream of getting to 225 by the end of 33, that's starting to go away. To get there, I've mapped it out. i got to add about seven pounds a month. My October, my October goal is 175. This was October 3 when this day happened. So I go there. I look at the bench. I can already feel those old beliefs coming back. I can already feel me struggling under that weight and not being able to imagine adding another five pounds. So what I did is what I learned. I went and I found a really strong guy in the gym. I went up to him and said, hey, man, I know you're busy. I have this dream of lifting 225 pounds, and I'm stuck at 165 right now. I'm at my absolute plateau. Would you help me get past this today? Would you help sit with me and encourage me and be there to spot me if I start dropping the weight so we can just load up as much as we can, we can get past this? And he goes, absolutely, I'm in. I'm your guy. My name's Deshaun. What's yours? I say, my name's Sam. He says, Mike's coming in a couple minutes. We're going to bench press today. You're going to get in with us, and you're going to get past 165 pounds. Mike comes in. He says, older white guy. Deshaun tells him the story. We start loading on weight. We get to 165. I lift it. We get to 170, and I lift it. We get to 175, and I lift it. I lift it 15 times over three sets with the help of these guys, all by myself. I wasn't feeling particularly strong that day. I wasn't feeling well-rested. I wasn't feeling on my A game. But with the help of two strangers, these angels, we'll put them on screen if you're watching the video of this right now. With the help of these two angels, I was able to beat my October goal on the third of the month. That's how much stronger I was than I thought I was. And that was brought out by just a couple of people willing to love and support me. And you could bring that out in other people, and you could recruit people to bring that out of you as well. Now, as I was leaving, Mike, this older guy, he goes, Sam, you are walking out of here growed. And I said, fuck yes, I am growed. But he didn't know I was growed in more ways than one. My heart was growed. My capacity to love was growed. My willingness to maybe accept that there are strangers out there who want to help me if they just know what I need help with was growed. I was growed, and I was stronger too. Now, we made some magic that day. That's what magic is. 
Magic is working in the mystery. I told you that. Magic is being able to courageously work towards what's possible. Apparently, me beating my October goal on the 3rd of October was possible. I didn't know that, but I found that out. So what's possible? Is it possible for you to be a little bit more loving? A little bit kinder? I know the, I know the answer is yes. I know you know that's possible. Is it possible that you could love so openly and so freely and so courageously, even if you get shut down, even if people aren't feeling that vibe, you just keep going, keep loving, strong, courageously, openly, powerful. Is it possible that that could change your environment? That you could love strangers so hard Maybe a little bit of that rubs off on them and they start loving a little harder too. I think deep down you know that's possible too. So time's now. You're not getting any younger. The earth isn't getting any better. We need each other right now. And that scares me. You know, I don't want to head towards some utopic vision. But I know that we can do better than that we have been doing. I'll speak for myself. I know I can be doing better than I have been doing. I know I can love a little bit harder. I know I can show up a little bit more. I know I can check in on people a little bit more. I know I can check in on strangers, see how they're doing, see if they need a stranger to come check in on them. In the time you've been watching this video, multiple people have died of suicide. Multiple people have died of overdose. People have been trafficked. You know, stuff's happening. The time is really now. People have given up in the time that you've listened to this video. The world needs your magic so badly. The world needs you to start working in the mystery. The world needs you to reconnect with what's possible. And the mystery is not what needs to be done. You know what needs to be done. The mystery is why aren't you doing it yet? Now for this episode, I've brought on a good friend. Somebody who I've known for... Over 10 years, I think it's all 11 of my sobriety, somebody that has personally inspired me, an amazing artist, an amazing magician, an amazing witch. Her name is Krylon, and there's somebody who I've looked up to for a long time, and somebody whose way of working with the mystery, way of being in the mystical, way of being a magical being in people's lives, checking in on them, sending them love, creating amazing things that you didn't think were possible for a human to create. This is an amazing person, somebody who has touched my life personally, and I hope you enjoy my conversation with Krylon. Krylon. Sam. Thank you for being on my show. Thank you for having me. We were talking before we sat up here, and mm -hmm. I think we figured that you've been sober longer than I've been sober. Yes. You were in San Francisco when I first got sober 10 and a half years ago uh -huh. and I saw you at the first, what was called dark secrets meeting. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I must know you for more than 10 years. Like we must've known each other for more than 10 years now. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Time yeah. has flown Time by. by pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, and we've grown. <laughs> we've grown a lot. Yeah. I always start this way. Krylon, who are you? Who am I? Ooh. That can be as big <laughs> or as small of a question as you want. I, I am me. That's a good answer. I remember when I first got sober, one of the, the big differences in the sober community is when I was out using and drinking, me and my buddies were always like planning and scheming about what we were going to do. Like, oh, I'm going to create a YouTube channel or I'm going to make sculpture or I'm going to do this. I remember when I first got sober, that there were artists who were actually showing their work mm -hmm. and DJs who were actually playing sets. I don't know if you remember the, definitely the Dark Secrets crew, but the 2900 Florida crew, mm -hmm. those 10 p.m. meetings were full of artists, DJs, oh, yeah. writers, mm -hmm. and everybody was producing work, mm -hmm. getting it out there. And I remember the first time I heard you share and you're like, my name's Krylon. I gave myself that name and you went on to talk about parts of your artistic journey. I just yeah. was left completely inspired. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that's, that's why I wanted you on the show is I, I just have so much respect for you mm -hmm. as an artist yeah. and a creator. And through the years that I've known you, not only were you producing 
work to share with the world but in many ways you were like a living piece of art with the 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 marks that you gave yourself i believe i knew you back when you were drawing them you knew me before i put them on yes yeah so to watch mm-hmm. this process of mm-hmm. in which i have done through tattoo of of decorating our bodies the way that we want them to and the transformations of your hair yeah. from week to week were yeah. still still, saying things. still still doing it were you know, magical oh, and gravity you defying <laughs> yeah. looks that should not be casually worn just for a friday but it, why not just blown away <laughs> yeah could you tell us a little bit like we can stick to the the format i think we're all rehearsed at a little bit of what it was like what happened what it's like now but mixed in with with you as an artist and as somebody who dedicates their life to creating well you know honestly i get insp- i got inspiration from different people over the years i mean my my thing is continuing to have an open mind to what being an artist has to look like you know because i honestly only i um i have to grow you know i i can't stay stuck in this this monotonous thing that somehow defined me over the years but i get to grow f- from that and in, into more vast and either you know intricate ideologies of what i am you know what i mean and i i get inspired from just being alive really just from just the experience of being alive in general i don't believe that well i used to believe way back in the day i used to believe that the reason why i was an artist is because i drank right it's like i drinking is what ultimately leads an artist to to create right i was like oh look at all of the famous artists uh, that died and of course they died right? <laughs> like all the famous artists that died they were they were absolute messes you know so i thought that's just that's that's what it's going to be i'm going to i'm doomed to be this artistic mess crushed by the weight crushed of, by the weight of, of your that. artistic talent yeah, yeah. and it's going to be all written about in this Oh, like grandiose biography, right? <laughs> and played by some amazing actor. You know what I mean? Like that was what's going on in my head. You know? But we all know that that's where the problem is centered. So I listened to the story that the problem told me and believed it because it was spoken in my own voice, right? I didn't realize until after years of being sober that alcohol might have opened my eyes to the artist that I already am, but it didn't give me the sight to be that artist, you know? Um, that was divinely orchestrated. And the more I I lean into the divinity of my creation as, as an artist, I, I get free from, from that sort of the discomfort that alcohol is the one that created me as an artist, because that's bullshit, you know, it's, excuse me, I don't want to curse. I don't know if that's something I can no, do. We, oh, we curse, yeah. Oh, good, yeah, that's bullshit. <laughs> You know, we're properly labeled, explicit people know. Nice, nice. Tell me more. I eventually just sort of let go. When I was really young, extremely, extremely young, my mom taught me how to do hair. She taught me how to sew. You know, um, I used to wear her clothes, you know. And then eventually I came out thinking that I was just a gay boy. But before that, before coming out, I found sort of the LGBTQI world um, via this cheerleader, this male cheerleader that used to, um, that used to go to my junior high school in San Diego where I grew up. He was spreading these rumors that me and my best friend were having sex, which was complete bullshit. Although I wanted to have sex with him, (laughs) (laughs) but he didn't fucking know that. Right. And so um, I was, it was that whole, I'm beating you up after school thing. Right. And everybody's like, Kylan's gonna well my my old name you, which you was TT told okay. him uh huh you're gonna beat him up I told him oh, that. okay yeah. okay I told Keep him I was gonna beat him up because he was spreading those rumors and I didn't want people to see me as what you know what I mean it's a it's that same old sort of like hide who you are thing and so that I won't get beat up so the attention on who I really am won't be turned on me you know I was like I have to hide that and I um I was terrified of people finding out the truth that I was actually in love with my best friend at the time. His name was Jamie. Instead of beating him up, 
I wound up asking him about his whole gay world, you know? And he was terrified. He was like, oh God, I'm ready to get my ass kicked. And I'm like, I'm not gonna kick your ass. I actually wanted to ask you, what's it like being gay? And he's like, oh. <laughs> How'd you know? Huh? How'd that you... he was gay? Yeah. Oh my God, the whole school knew that. <laughs> he was very, very gay. Okay. He's a cheer. Well, not like, not male, men can be cheerleaders, but Ralph was the female version of the cheerleader. You okay. know what I mean? He introduced me to Hillcrest in San Diego, which is this whole gay area. And I, and I sort of got into the, LG, the, the LGBT youth organizations in hell. I think it's GYA is what gay youth Alliance is what it was called. And, um, and I was all a part of that, all a part of it. And I started to, lean more towards and then I met this guy like my, who was my best friend it was toxic 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 thing I don't know there's a lot there's so much okay <laughs> in this story I mean it's like my whole life story is so crazy but um basically I became a club kid oh, that's yeah, like that's, the short story yeah, yeah it's not a stretch I could see that yeah I I just became I got I got really into I saw, I read this, this, this magazine called My Comrade that was coming out of, out of New York City at the time. And I saw the pictures of these just really creative, really amazing people. And they weren't, they didn't, they didn't really, they weren't like drag queens. They weren't like, they were this whole gender bending, gender fucking like, non-binary which we can we have the language for now as being right. non-binary back then you were just androgynous right you were just kind of alternative and i wanted that and so i started to move towards being a lot more creative in the way that i expressed myself the makeup and clothes and making my own clothes because my mom taught me how to sew and you know um but then that alcohol came into the picture as well and I was drinking a lot back then. I mean, I was, I drank all the way up to, I got sober, but it was, it was immediate love affair, you know, because there was also the, the connection with, um, with confidence that I didn't have, you know, it was that I don't give a fuck what you think about me. I have my cocktail and my outfit in the dance floor and that's all I need. You know, what I didn't record or what I didn't realize then what I later realize now is that that alcohol did do for me what I could not do for myself but as an alcoholic the allergy you know kicks in and um it started to I mean I, I, I knew when I got sober about the consequences you know I learned about the consequences when I got sober but I didn't knew but what I didn't know then was that all of the consequences that was going on in my life was a direct result of me continuously picking up that drink, continuously using that drink as a solution to the reaction that I had with reality. You know what I mean? The reaction that I had with people, places, things, and situations. The consequences came pretty quick where I dropped out of school and I ran away and then I ran away to New York City in the 90s and became a club kid in, in New York City in the 90s and... I never got into anything heavier than alcohol, really. Really? Yeah. Wow. L let me ask you about the scene. Mm -hmm. So I was in raves and mm -hmm. EDM, and it, it's interesting when that is your solution, which mm -hmm. at the time that was my solution, was mm -hmm. to get fucked up, to drink, to drug. Mm -hmm. And for somebody that was like, you know, I really kind of came out hyper- self-conscious and mm -hmm. sensitive and like the the pain of just existing was intense so by the time i found alcohol found drugs it really was like a balm it like really did quiet the inner voices it was like some of the first times i just loved being mm -hmm. was in an altered state of reality and that's obviously for everyone listening that's not ideal Right. Like mm. for for you to be your self-destruction to be the only time you enjoy existing. 
you know, not, mm. not a great place to be, but mm. there are a ton of kind of strange lessons that were learned in that realm of self-destruction. Like I remember the first time um, being on, I can't remember if it was cocaine or ecstasy. One of them was the first time I realized, oh, like nobody really cares how I'm dancing. Mm. Like if I'm out having fun dancing, mm. nobody really cares. And before it was like, you know, I, I could conceptualize all the various ways this would end terribly for me or destroy my reputation or mm. whatever, because everyone would know I'm a dork or that I can't dance. Mm. And so as you've had time to reflect on the, the club scene and being a club kid, what have you parsed out as like, oh, these are actual, it, cause it's so easy to write it off as like, this was just a period of mayhem and destruction. Mm hmm. What, what did you learn or keep from these that you, you hoped that you hope it, young people might be able to find without the self-destruction? When I look back on it, I look back on it with, um, well, you know, my sponsor always says you can look back, but don't gaze. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? And no, I've never heard that. Yeah. It's, it's that whole thing of not regretting the past and I don't regret the past, you know? I actually think that if you're young and you're an alcoholic, you might need to just go all the way till you hit a bottom, you know, like that's what I believe. And it doesn't have to look like being homeless. It doesn't have to look like being, you know, losing all of these things. It can be just getting to a point where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. You're just done with digging, right? Right. Because for me, I didn't have that same experience. I didn't, I wasn't homeless. I didn't, well, I guess you can say technically I was because I was living in the squat for a second, for a second, you know. Um, but I still wasn't sleeping on the street, right? I still didn't like, I, 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 there was a lot of things that I can look at and say, well, that didn't happen to me yet, you know. But what did happen to me, like there's a physical side of things but the spiritual side of stuff like there's like the um our life had become unmanageable like my living part was still kind of manageable but the life part that's the emotional part right that's the spiritual part that's the part where I have a conversation with something greater than you know the physical stuff you know what I mean like the money and the job and the you know, the house or the car or whatever, all of that stuff is the living part. That's the part that's the physical stuff. But the spiritual part is the life stuff. And my life had become absolutely unmanageable. I had no connection to any kind of spiritual thing. I was totally like spun out in self, spun out. And so I, I believe, back to your question, I believe that if a person is young and they're, and they're like truly alcoholic, they got to get to a point like I can't, I can't, I can't, I can wish them a happy bottom, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? But honestly, every single step I took toward the bottom was necessary for me to hit it, you know? And, and necessary for me to realize that I absolutely was desperate. That sense of desperation, like I had to get that. And once I got that sense of desperation, I was willing to do whatever the fuck it took to change what the shit I was going on in my head, you know? So, and, and like artistically, I was into some really awesome shit. You know what I mean? I, I was, when I was really, really, when I was young, around that same time of being a club kid, a little earlier than that, I was into um, Topi, which is Temple of Psychic Youth. So that's like a, that's connected to psychic TV and throbbing gristle and Jenna's Peorage. And it's just a whole bunch of little witchy kids running around, like, you know, reading esoteric books and, you know, practicing pagan rituals and stuff like that. Like that's, that was my shit back in, you know, the nineties. And, um, you know, not much has changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once a witch. <laughs> no, but, um, Honestly, um, yeah, and and so I did all of that, and I read the books, and I listened to the cool music, and I saw the awesome 
movies and, you know, the really alternative avant-garde things. And I'd done all of that stuff, but there was still this fucking hole that was there, right? And it was more about not all of the things that I thought was going to fix me to make me the most creative, most interesting person in the world. When all I really wanted was to feel comfortable in my skin and have a positive and creative um experience with reality, you know, instead of a negative and destructive experience. So every single step that I took towards the bottom was necessary for me to hit it, you know. Speaking of which, so you go from New York to Berlin, right? Isn't that part of the drunkalogue? Yeah. If I'm remembering, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard you speak a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Over the past from, 10 years, I've heard I you actually, speak. <laughs> I actually went from New York to Montreal. Okay. And I was in Montreal for a little bit. And then I went from Montreal back to New York and then from New York to Berlin. And what's happening during these transitions, like through these moves? Well, from New York to Montreal, I was, I was, a dan I was doing dancing in New York as well. Like actual. you like a go-go dancer? Well, I was doing that too. <laughs> I was doing all kind of dancing. But my, what took me to Montreal was I was a part of um, a, 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 a dance piece that was called red light roosters it was at agora de la dance um or le tangent i think that's what it was called and i i went there to do that piece with this amazing dancer choreographer george stamos and i got there hung out loved it met a boy loved him stuck around there because that's what you do when you meet someone that you follow especially a french even if it's french canadian and um and then we broke up, went back to New York, met another person. When I was, yeah, it's it like a whole bunch of transitions. But anyways, wound up going to Berlin. I think it was in 98 that I went to Berlin, like the end of 98. Yeah. And um, wasn't planning on staying in Berlin, was just planning on hanging out with this other boy that I met who wound up falling in love with me and we fell in love and got married and all this other stuff. But You've been married? Yeah, I've been married. Wow. Yeah. I'm learning stuff. Keep going. Yeah. Don't stop. Um, but, Montre but, but Berlin is by far the most fascinating city I've ever been in. I still absolutely love Berlin 100%. You know, um, and I got into the theater there. I got into a band there. I did a lot of, you know, creative artistic <laughs> performances there, um, which I did in New York as well. Um, as an artist, what I would do with, you know, alcohol and art for me anyway, that, that there was like this no holds bar thing, right? Um, no hold is, how do you pronounce that? Yeah. No holds barred. Yeah. No yeah. holds barred. Yeah. There was like, no, there's no holds barred thing where, um, I, I all do, out, all out, yeah, all out for art, you know. And and my whole aesthetic was to present very beautifully, like extremely like runway model esque, but then do some of the most disgusting things on stage. Like that was part of my aesthetic, right? And people were like, "Oh my god, I can't believe she's like, it's like shock, shooting shock milk value. out of her butt," you know what I mean? Or it was shock value, yeah. But it was also it was for me it was. I would my my and my I was trying to destroy this this image of physical beauty. Like there is a lot of ugly to beauty and a lot of beauty to ugly. And I wanted that to be sort of the on the forefront of my performance art, you know. Um and I just sort of took that and ran with it. And um the more I drank and the drunker I got, the more extreme that became. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. Um and so I did some pretty crazy performances. <laughs> Are there, this is pre-internet or? This is pre-internet. Oh, wow. You lucked out. Yeah. I mean, but I don't, I've done, I've done them since, some of them since, like the ones that a lot of people. You've resurrected them. Yeah. But, pr but probably more consciously. Yeah. More consciously. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've done, I did a. Pop, my popcorn show, which is one that everybody pretty much knows, not everybody, but those who know me as an artist and, ex and it's seen me as an artist knows about it. Um, I did it the, for the first time in New York City in the 90s before I moved to Berlin at this club called 
um, Foxy. Uh, the Cock is the name of the club, but the party was called Foxy, and it was put on by my one of my dear friends, Mario, uh, Mario Diaz. And um, he's just a big club promoter in, in, in New York City. And we kind of grew up in New York together. Um, and he um, he's like, I got this club and I really need some performers. You want to come and perform? And we were going and do, and I was go-go dancing at the time and performing at a uh, restaurant that I worked at, a drag restaurant that I worked at called Stingy Lulu's. This was around the same time I was like coming into myself as a trans woman as well, but I decided not to transition because people were getting killed and oh, it was a whole thing. But, um, and he's like, would you come and perform? And I said, sure. And I didn't know what to do because I wasn't at that moment doing avant-garde really kind of like that my ideas around my my creative artistic expression wasn't formulated yet I was still trying to figure that one out and um and I'm like sure I'll do it and for some strange reason I was like oh why don't I put shaving cream all over my body shove a broom up my ass and sweep the floor with the broom then go outside and jump on a cop car Sounds great. Give me a shot. Oh <laughs> my two, God. Two shots of Jägermeister and woo, I was off to the races. And I did. And it was a competition and I won. <laughs> Were you arrested? I wasn't arrested. Okay. That was part of what I wanted though. I wanted to get arrested. I was like, my whole idea was to get arrested. So the whole, like the majority of the club followed me out of the club as I walked down the street and jumped on a cop car and the cop was inside the pizza joint. <laughs> having pizza and didn't do anything it was oh. like this random hey like, probably took black, one look at you and he's like black i'm not queen. getting paid enough for this <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna do it. i'm just gonna eat my pizza yeah yeah, yeah. new york i mean it was the east village too yeah you know alphabet city to be exact so and so what happens when do you end up deciding to change to get sober you know what happened was is um things got worse and worse as it always does, you know, like it wasn't fixing it anymore. It wasn't fixing me. I was having panic attacks. I was like, I just felt this sense of nothingness. I felt this void. I couldn't see my life without it. And I couldn't see my life continuing on the way I was going. I had physical things popping up. Like I had cramps that was, I, Oh God, I was in the, in the apotheca. So it was sort of like the pharmacy, um, because I had gotten to a band in, in a band in in Berlin, and I I, I remember I was like I'm I, I have to get something for my stomach because my stomach was on fire, you know. And it was the day after, like the morning after drinking all night, and I was sitting in the apotheca, sweating, praying once again, please help me get through this. I tried to do a shot in order to sort of fix it and the shot didn't fix it. And I thought I was going to die. I was absolutely convinced I was dying and it's sort of all of a sudden calmed down, you know, which is kind of evidence of some greater higher power doing for me what I cannot do for myself because I probably would have died. Yeah. You know? But I first watched someone strange reason didn't. And that is, that didn't like that stands out as a point where I was wanting, like was wanting to change my life, but I still drank for like another year before I did something past that. And then I got to a, 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 I don't know. One day I woke up and I'm like, okay. You know, um, I was living with this artist in Berlin who, um, okay, let me back up. Me and my ex-boy, me and my ex-husband separated whole story behind that you know a whole entire story behind that but eventually we anyway we separated and I wound up living in a squat in Friedrichshain um and I was stealing beer from the squat and me and my dog and um okay Sam I think I have to tell this story and okay, okay yeah we're, I'm here for it okay so this is the story I moved to Berlin to hang out with this guy um, I, who I actually met in San Diego on the beach and re-met him again because he came to New York when I was living in New York with the sugar daddy. And anyways, he came to New York and he, um, I absolutely was in love with him. 
And so I, he told me that him and his boyfriend broke up and then he gave me, invited me to come to, to, to Berlin. And I was like, I don't know what I was going to do. And he was like, I can get you some kind of work there. So he bought me a plane ticket. I'd never been out of, um, off of the North American continent, you know, and I jumped on it and I went to Berlin. I, I, I was, my plan was just to go and check it out. I didn't know anything about Berlin. I knew that there was a wall there at some point. I remember that like, there was like a whole bunch of like racist Nazis there at some point. I didn't know anything other than that. Um, I didn't know that, that, that like the history of like, you know, the cabaret and all of that stuff, you know, like the, there was such a huge drag community back then. But anyways, I got to Berlin and fell in love with him, got married, found out that his family owns half of Berlin. So suddenly I'm rich because I'm married to this fucking rich guy, right? I'm flying around Berlin and flying around Europe and business class and staying at the Ice Hotel in the north of Sweden and doing all these things, drinking champagne from champagne, champagne from champagne, you know, like that whole thing. And I have arrived, you know, I have hit the jackpot, you know, I am um, blessed and lucky, right? And that still, there's still that hole there, right? Anyways, me and this guy, Hendrik, we decided to, um, we decided to do this thing called Camino de Santiago. This was in like 2001 or 2002. And it's this pilgrim's path, this Christian pilgrimage that goes across Spain to Santiago de Compostela, which is right above Portugal in Galicia. And I'm like, okay, we're going to do that. We decided to do it by bike. Um, we get on the bike, stop it. We, we, we first start in Barcelona, go up through the Pyrenees to Andorra. And then we, then that's where we join the actual Camino de Santiago or uh, there's an English name for it. I think it's called the Jacob's pass or something. But anyways, we go across that. We're doing it by bike. I'm drinking the whole time. As one does. As one does on, you know, I'm like getting fucking hammered. You know yeah. what I mean? On Christian bike. pilgrimage, time yes. to drink. Time to drink. Yeah. Uh, what is that? That says wet wine to me. That's what that says, <laughs> you know? So I'm doing this all the way to Santiago de Compostela. Um, and then when we get into Galicia, which is one, Galicia is beautiful. I start having, and this is the first time this has happened to me on this level. I started having overwhelmingly realistic psychic experiences, you know, like really, really, really like skin crawling, um, spiritual experiences. Right. Um, overlaying the, the physical world or are you somewhere else? No, like, literally. like are you walking through the world while your experiences yes. or are you debilitated experiences? No, I'm walking through the world. Okay. So it's kind of like I'm an on overlay bike. Yeah. on. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm into um, it. And that's what would happen. That I, I, that happened to me a lot when I was drinking, but not not on this level. Like I, yeah. when I was drinking, I would have these experiences where I felt like um, what what I later found out through friends when I explained the, to them my experiences. They're like, "Oh, it sounds like you were on acid, or it sounds like you were on ecstasy, or it sounds like you're on mushrooms." And I'm like, it "Wasn't it was right? Just Jack and Coke." <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but anyways, I get to Gal Galicia and I'm having these experiences. I'm, my ex-husband is German. So if it's, if it isn't proven scientific shit, then he just absolutely doesn't believe it. Right. Like 100%. You know what I mean? We get to a place on the beach, this like hike, there's a campground on the beach that we decided to camp at. And we're camping at the beach and he, we were in this relationship where it was kind of, it was very open as long as we were safe and we talked about it. You know, it's like, oh, if you're going to go and hook up with someone else, then, you know, let's have a conversation about it and make sure that you're safe. And we got to this place of trusting each other. I broke that trust once before we left. It was pride before we left to go on this trip. I broke that trust by barebacking some guy in the in the dark room in Berlin, which is 
and I was in the blackout, came to, the guy was whatever, long, you know, it was all over me. Um, and so I was terrified and told him about it. And he's like, okay, well, we're going to have to wait and see what happens. And um, so I told him about it. Anyways, cut to where I'm at the beach. Um, we're on the beach. He decides to go off into the bushes and play with some boys. And I'm like, I got my sangria. I got the waves, the ocean, the seagulls. I'm cool, you know. And I'm drinking and drinking and hanging out. And and then I had this this sort of inspiration to get up and walk along the beach. So I walked all the way along the beach until I got to this point where there was a jetty. And I sort of went around the jetty through the water and around the jetty to the other side of it. And when I got to the other side of it, there was a tiny little beach with this cave. And the moment my feet touched the sand towards the cave, I got like almost grossly sick it was like I like this revulsion came up over me and I kept walking towards the cave and it was almost as like I it was like I couldn't stop myself walking towards the cave and so I get I go into the cave <laughs> and like deep into the cave and I'm deep into the cave there's no more light really but it's extremely cold and I can see my breath you know, so it wasn't totally dark, but I could see my breath and I was sort of paralyzed and, and I went kind of into a blackout, but it was more like a brownout because for some strangers, I can hear myself talking, but I don't know who I was talking to. And it was something about not me, please save me or whatever. And I could not understand what I was saying. And I wound up back on the beach. So obviously I walked there back to by where I was. And Hendrick was like, where have you been? I've been looking everywhere for you. And I was crying and stuff. And I told him, there's a cave we have to go to. And um, he followed me. He came into the cave and it was a real cave. And we went inside and he was like, this is really kind of creepy that it's this cold and it's the middle of summer. And I told him, I believe that we have to sleep in the cave. And he's like, I'm not sleeping in a fucking cave in the middle of the summer <laughs> in Spain when we're on our way to, you know, he's like, I'm not going to do that. And I'm like, I really think that we have to do this. And he's like, no, we're not doing that. So we get to Galicia and um, we get to Galicia. We're in Galicia. We get to Santiago de Compostela, which is the big main city. And that's the main city at the end of the pilgrim's path. So it was just filled with all these sort of Christians with their big, huge sticks from walking that path, you know. Um, and it was also simultaneously filled with a bunch of like, healers and tarot readers and bone throwers and old women with really weird satchels filled with herbs and stuff. And I was like, what the fuck is going on here? I did not, I was, my mind was blown. And I went into the big church because there's a huge church there at the end of, um, of the end of the pilgrim's path where everybody goes in and they look around. And so we went inside of the church and went into the catacombs, which was downstairs. It was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful church, ancient, ancient church. And I just remember stopping, and I don't know why, but I did a prayer there because I wanted somehow Hendrick to see what I was seeing and experience what I was experiencing. And when we walked out of the church, um, our bike lights were on, which is like, whatever. It was just weird that it was a coincidence. But I turned to him and I was like, why are our bike lights on? And he's like, well, because that little thing right there that's on the tire, that's called a dynamo. And as we turn the wheels, the lights light up. That way we can save money on getting batteries, right? I'm like, yeah, I get that, but we're not riding the bikes right now. So why are the lights on? And he's like, oh, because we just drove across Spain. So it's probably residual energy, you know, scientific Germans. So anyways, I, I kind of wrote, wrote that off and we went into this vegan raw restaurant, which is crazy because I'm vegan now, but I didn't know what the hell a vegan was back then, let alone raw or whatever. So we go in and we hang out and this guy comes up. I speak Spanish just by default because I'm from San Diego and I was speaking Spanish the entire time we're on, um, on the trip. And this guy comes up and I started ordering to him, I started ordering with him in Spanish and I noticed that he had a little accent 
And I asked him where he's from. And he's like, oh, I'm from San Diego. And I'm like, shut the fuck up. I'm from San Diego. And then we're like, had this whole moment of like San Diego and like love, right? And I asked him, I'm like, how long have you been here? He's like, I've been living here for like 10, 15 years. I'm like, dude, what the fuck is up with this place? Like, I am picking up some really crazy psychic energy here. I don't know if it's just me. Am I going crazy? He's like, oh, well, it makes absolute sense. And I'm going to tell you why. And he gives me this whole thing about how Galicia is, um, it's, it's known for, um, like back in the Inquisition times when they were killing witches, they just kind of let the Galicians do what they do. They didn't actually go there and, and mess with them. And there was also, um, so Galicia means land of Gaul or Gaelic land. So they speak Gallego, which is a mixture of like Castilian, Spanish, Portuguese, and Gaelic. It's really crazy. And there's a whole history from that. And he's like, and... Um, there was a lot of Druids here and a lot of people who practice pagan rituals. And the majority of those rituals was done in caves. And I turned around to Hendrick and I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm like crying. And the guy's like, what's wrong? I'm like, I had this whole experience inside of a cave and I don't know if it was like a person or what I was talking to. And to this day, I absolutely believe, and I'm sober almost 18 years, you know what I mean? And to this day, I absolutely believe that I was speaking to a druid effigy or some sort of, you know. Yeah. So anyways, we leave that place and get back, you know, get back to our campground. The bike light stayed on all the way until we landed back in Berlin, which is really crazy. And he even thought that that was crazy. Cut to two weeks later, Hendrik gets this really gnarly fever and he has all these bumps all over his body. And his aunt is a doctor and she just assumed it was chicken pox. And I, and that, which would explain why I didn't get it because I've already had chicken pox, you know? Um, but his fever got more and more and more and more and he got rushed to the hospital. Um, he stayed in the hospital for a few days and I got a call from him saying, you have to come home. There's something that we need to talk about. So I get back to the house um, and I'm, of course, drunk off my ass. And he's like, um, we have AIDS. He says, we, right? And um, and you have to go get tested to see where your levels are and da 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 And I immediately decided I was going to kill myself. And yeah. I'm like, I'm killing myself. Because of that night, that, in that blackout, that I fucking barebacked this guy. I obviously gave you AIDS. I'm killing myself. And he's like, you know, you're fucking not. You're not going to leave me to deal with this on my own. You're staying right where you are, you know. And so we both went to go get, I, so we went to, to the doctor and I got tested, came out negative. And the doctor was like, all right, well, we're going to give it a couple of more tries. Right. Came back a week later, tested negative. And then like, we're going to do this thing called a direct viral load test to see if, you're de- if you're just undetectable, but if a direct viral load test, I guess, can tell if the amount of virus that had been in your body or something like that. So they do this direct viral load test and it turns out that I've never had HIV in my system and I was negative. So we turn to him and Hendrick's like, well, I don't understand that. He's like, and the doctor was like, well, you had to have done something. And he's like, well, I gave some guy a blowjob one, you know, once and da, da, da. And the doctor's like, it is extremely rare, almost impossible to contract HIV by giving a blowjob or getting one. And he's like, yeah, but I went to the dentist. He's like, yeah, but you'd have to literally have blood coming out of your mouth and gushing and da, 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 da. And so there was this whole thing. Was it at the bushes? That's what I think. Uh, right? So the cave. Yeah. So yeah. Now yeah. You see where this is oh, going. Okay. I'll let I'll let you say it. <laughs> you yeah, just, I got you it. You see where this is yeah. going. So yeah, he um so I got it, I got pissed. I got so angry. I'm like, what the fuck did you do? 
I'm sitting here. I told you what I did. And you hid that, you know, you hid that from me. I was so fucking angry. I was like, you know, I questioned everything about him, you know. Um, And then in my rage, I like ran and got pretty wasted and wound up in this park called Gerlitzer Park. I think it was Gerlitzer Park that I was at. And I was sitting there just pissed off. and, And then that thought came. Oh my God, he should have slept in the cave. You know, um, whatever that was in the cave saved me from catching whatever. Because why the fuck didn't I get it? You know, even if it was him that got it first, why didn't I still get it? So there was this really weird grace period between when he contracted it and, you know, it incubated and then turned into eight. Like it completely like happened boom like that for him he's zero converted pretty quick and um which i guess was you know great anyways long, we wound up breaking up obviously you know i stayed with him for a little bit but because i didn't know what else to do i didn't know where else to go i was completely broke i was in a foreign you know a country that i spoke i speak german you know i learned german took german because i was in the deutsches theater and all this stuff but um I, um, I don't know. I, I just didn't know what else to do. And that's when I met my friend Sabina, who's this artist. Well, no, I met her long before that, but my friend Sabina, who's this artist, she used to go to this this bar that I used to work at and just sit there and not drink. And I always wondered what the fuck is that about? You know, and turns out she was sober and, and an artist and an amazing artist. And, um, and she told me, she's like, hey, if you need a place to stay, you can stay at my place. But she's like, I'm locking all my shit up inside of a, 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 a like a closet because I don't trust you. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Where's that coming from? She's like, well, you're an alcoholic. I don't trust you. And I'm like, how do you even know that I'm alcoholic? Are you even supposed to say that? Like, I don't even think that's something that you're supposed to say. I'm supposed to say that, right? Like, isn't that what you people do? Like, I didn't know. And um, so she, um, she let me stay at her place. And she left. She was in Paris. And then she was in the south of France. And, um, and then she came back eventually after about a year or something. And we lived in a place together. And then that's when the thought came of me getting sober. I mean, I just skipped a whole bunch of stuff, but yeah. Yeah, I, I got it. So what were, you, what were you hoping for Like when you get sober? Like, that's like a huge You know choice. what? I was hoping for, so my last 30 days looked like this. It looked like me butt naked in front of the computer, drinking red wine and looking up conspiracy theories because I thought it was the Illuminati that did this to me, right? I thought it was a Freemasons, you know? I was absolutely freaking myself out with that. I was digging myself into a conspiracy theory hole. Then the then that movie came out, what is it? The Da Vinci Code. And I was already on top of everything that the Da Vinci Code was talking about. I was way beyond that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, oh, you people are just now scratching the surface. Oh, man. Um, and I was just sick and tired of living in that much fear. And I did not know what to do. I was, just, and I didn't want to kill myself. You know, I just did not want to live like that. And I, Sabine is this beautiful artist and as she makes this beautiful art. And I was like, why can't I do that? Why can't I be like that? Be an artist, be alive, be happy and be sober. Like, what is this obsession with this fucking liquid? Yeah. You know, I'm like, why is it just consistently in my life? Like, I don't want, like, what would be so wrong with me just not doing it? And I'm like, oh, I just can't not do this. I don't know how to not do this. Yeah. I don't know how to live not doing this, you know? And, um, she told me about the recovery program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tell us a bit about the, about the journey. Cause just for people who aren't alcoholics or drug addicts, the first thing that happens is you've basically been avoiding reality mm-hmm. for 10 years or you've been, um, uh, that's good supplementing reality, mm-hmm. right. With altered states. And mm-hmm. so the first thing that happens when you get sober is you're, you're it's like really uncomfortable to be, Sober. Sober and feeling your feelings. And 
You know, for me, it wasn't. Really? For me, I was stoked. I craved to breathe a sober, draw a sober breath. I wanted that. I didn't know how to... I didn't know how to do anything other than what I was doing. And I really wanted to experience what it was. It was like being high all over again by just not being high. You know, it was so beautiful for me. And I, I had energy and, and I was like, I wasn't bogged down by where am I going to get the next drink? And when am I going to get the next drink? And where am I going to, you know, it was all, my whole life was planned around just what bar I'm going to go to and who's, dick I was going to suck to get money to fucking get more drinks. Right. It was just consistently in my life. And I was so over it. Um, so yeah, I was actually really happy. Oh, good for you. I was really happy. I mean, there was in that, that was the pink cloud for like, I don't know, maybe four months, five months. And then it sort of hit me because reality kicks in obviously. And when reality kicked in for me, um, I still was stoked on being sober, but I hadn't worked all the 12, you know, I haven't worked, I haven't done all of the recovery stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, you know, it's like, we, we just do our best. Yeah. yeah. I haven't done all the recovery stuff that I needed to do in order to maintain that sobriety. Right. I was feeling restless, irritable, and discontent. I was feeling anxious. You know, I was, I was just like, there was something that was missing and that was alcohol. Right. Um, I kept in touch with other people who were recovered, you know, and continued to develop that community yeah. around, a, you know, recovered people. And, um, and it was, I just kind of threw myself into that, you know. What are the big, like, life lessons that you gathered? Because you've been sober 18 years. Mm-hmm. Almost uh, 17. Almost 17. Yeah, I'm almost 11. No, it's almost 18, but I'm 17 now. You're 17. <laughs> yeah. I'm 10. Yeah. I know. It's going to feel great to say 18, though. Yeah, it is. Turn 18 years old. Christmas Day. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's your birthday? What do you consider, like, the the big lessons you never want to forget during the time that you've been sober? The huge lesson is um, surrender. <sighs> surrender. I'm a big what if you know, I'm a, what if this and what if that, you know, oh, I will literally, too. what if myself right out of reality, straight into fantasy and right into a panic attack in a matter of seconds. But what I learned is that it's not about what if it's about what is, because what is, is what's real, right? If I'm in what is, I'm in reality. I'm in the place where the problem is not centered. I'm in a, a position to, um, to allow something greater than myself to guide and direct me. But when I'm in what if I'm in fantasy, I'm right there where the problem is centered and that problem is guiding and directing me. Right. Because it all, it always starts with this thought. It's like the thought I can have a great day. And then the thought happens. And then that thought turns into a story and that story turns into a feeling and that feeling turns into a belief and that belief turns into an obsession. And when I'm obsessed, I'm uncomfortable. And when I'm uncomfortable, I want fast acting relief, right? So what do I do? I need to pause when agitated, meditate, do some sort of like spiritual ritual, you know, prayer, that kind of thing, because that, that maintaining that the sort of conscious contact with that thing greater than my thinking that disrupts that entire chain of events. I can't fix me. And that's beautiful, beautiful knowledge is that I neither can I fix myself, nor do I need to try to fix myself. All I have to do is continue to take this action towards this power greater than my thinking. That does that work for me, right? That kind of guides me along my, my, my road. Um, and that could be like, God, Allah, Buddha, Krishna, you know, pagan gods, whatever. Like, I don't really go too deep into what that has to look like because every single color of the rainbow leads to the same pot of gold, you know? <laughs> that's amazing. Where did you pick that up from? <laughs> is that you? Yeah, that's me. Oh Everything my God. Me. <laughs> that's, that's genius. That's marketable. We'll have the t-shirts ready for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was, that was absolutely incredible. So yeah, surrender is not my strong suit either. 
may, I mean, it maybe it might be your strong suit now. I am a total meddler. I feel like, you know, uh, there's a line to accept the things I cannot change. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're crafty, industrious, <laughs> intelligent uh, fellow like myself, it feels like, well, I can change that. You know, I can influence this and call these people and meddle. And I'm mm. a meddler. Mm. I was having a thought the other night where I was thinking about how I got myself basically ejected out of a, mm. a work farm situation <laughs> through just raw manipulation, you know, manipulating my mom, manipulating one of the counselors there. Mm. Uh, and uh, I had a thought and I've always like had a deep resentment towards this place. And then I ha had a thought the other night. <laughs> I was listening to someone else share and I was just kind of like, you know, it probably would have been better if you had just stayed there. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're just like, uh, probably, I don't know, 15 years or something removed. It took 15 years to realize like, Oh yeah. You know what? Like you really meddled there. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, you probably should have stayed for a while. <laughs> that was probably not the worst place in the world. Yeah. <laughs> what else do you cling to dearly? Like what, uh, what, what do you stick with on a daily basis in terms of your tool belt? I'll tell you why I, our little book club is showing and telling our post-it note walls basically, mm -hmm. or, you know, the equivalent of when I went down to write down all the things, you know, daily affirmations and little reminders that I love. Um, I feel like I'm missing a ton. So I am fishing a bit, you know, mm. I, I do plan on stealing your best material oh, and presenting okay. it to well, my book club as my own. You know, it's honestly, it's all divinely given. So it's freely, it's divinely <laughs> inspired. So it's freely given. Right? Okay. And, um, thank you. And it has to be like, I can't hold on to it. You know, I'm super grateful that it's divinely inspired to begin with. Right. Um, but what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is I pray, I meditate, I ask this higher, greater thing to keep me from following a thought into a feeling, you know? Um, the thing is, is I want to say this, and I really think it's important. Um, there's nothing wrong with feeling your feelings, right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's a, it's a fact that I'm feeling my feelings. Like when I'm feeling a feeling, it's a fact that I'm feeling it, but not every feeling that I'm feeling is a fact. Right. <laughs> and, and that's also something I get to remember. It's like, where does this coming from? You know, but in the beginning of the pandemic, I got extremely panicky. I had major, major, major um, panic attacks. And it was just horrible. It was the worst I've ever felt in my entire life. Me too. I got very sick. Yeah. Yeah. Like mentally or physically? Both. Both. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't do well when the collective psyche is not doing well. Mm, yeah, same. Like maybe if I was in Alaska or like really far removed from it, mm -hmm. you know, Eden yeah. somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, when the when the collective is not doing well, I am not doing well. When, you know, when the culture war heats up, I am suffering. Yeah. You know, when, when people are... Uh, Anyway, keep going. I don't want to, no, no, you're no, on a roll. I, keep going. No, that it's, I totally get it. And that's the same. I had to, I didn't, I, that since I had a lot of insecurity. You know really? I mean? Yeah. Wow. It was major insecurity. And a lot of it stems from, um, you know, childhood stuff. Right. Because it's like the world and death and oh my God. And it was all about that. It was just so much death that I no longer believed that I was safe, you know? Um, and because we weren't really right. It was like, nobody knows about this virus. It, 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 they're still trying to figure it out. And da, da, da. So there was just a lot of insecurity. Oh, and the, if the shelves were empty. The yeah. The whole, thing, the whole like, thing, even if you weren't scared of the virus, yeah. there's a ton of stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was terrifying. <laughs> and so I, I, me and some friends, which we probably shouldn't have, went all the way up to <laughs> Oregon. Okay. <laughs> like we took a road trip because I was like, help. Right. And we stopped in, in Mount Shasta and we went into this big lake. And I just, I remember, you know, and it's the woods. It was like in the middle of the woods. We go into this lake. Um, 
And it's the first time I felt a little sense of peace. And I jumped into this cold, crystal clear lake. And, and I felt like I was being a little bit more rejuvenated. And, and I thought about it after that. I was like, well, you know, there's nothing in the world like a witch in the woods, right? Like that's what you, that's what I get my inspiration from. And I prayed and, you know, and I eventually got myself a, um, a therapist, um, and then I did hypnotherapy too. Oh, cool. And that hypnotherapy helped me to recognize that a lot of that, that, that fear stuff was old childhood wounds that just hasn't healed. And so I got to go back to those places where those wounds were inflicted and grab a hold of that little girl. Uh, now that I know it was a little girl, um, and bring her into the present to a safe space and tell her that she can leave those spaces because she was stuck in them, right? Wow. And what a beautiful thing. And as I did that more and more, I started to heal more and more. And, and, and what was revealed from all of that is that I'm transgendered. I'm a trans woman. And the, the outcome of all of that is I started my transgender journey. And, I, and the moment I took the first hormone shot, my depression, fear, anger, anxiety, and panic all completely vanished. Like wow. 100%. It's so crazy how that happened. So to your question of, what was it? <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't remember. I, it was something about post-it notes. and what? Yeah, what do I put on my post-it note wall? <laughs> <laughs> this too shall pass. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Like I can't have tomorrow's experience in today's reality. Like that's yeah. the truth. I can only experience what I'm experiencing right now. So why not surrender to that? Right. Why not to surrender to, I, there, I always wanted to feel like I'm present. Right. I like uh, alcoholics are so about not feeling or over feeling. Right. Like, Oh God, I don't feel enough. I, I need to feel this to be real. And what I learned is that, you don't have to feel it in order for it to be true, right? You don't have to, just because you, like reality isn't based on like what you feel it is. It's about what you experience it is, right? Like, I don't, I don't believe that it needs to be this feeling more so than it just needs to be an experience. And when I, as I experience it, there's a whole emotional range that goes with the experience of it anyway, you know, um, including not feeling something, not feeling something as a part of the emotional journey. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, the, the surrender part, the surrender part is really, really important because I don't know what this higher power thing has in store for me. And I don't get to peak. You know what I mean? Unfortunately. And the, my spiritual advisor, <laughs> <laughs> who walks with me, you know, um, who holds the flashlight while I dig. <laughs> he tells me, do not mistake God's grace for personal strength, which tells me to stay extremely humble. Um, and it reminds me that a smooth sea never made a good sailor. You yeah. Know, we learn how to sail through the rough waters. So on that note of sailing through the rough waters, and I'm, I'm sorry that this does distract a little bit from the, humility session but mm -hmm. one of the things that i do that i always have admired about you is is your like the inner wells of power that you're able to access mm -hmm. and this is all i've always just kind of felt in your presence like i'm in the presence of somebody who's really aware of where their power comes from and is really able to harness it and move with it there's a, a term i've been falling in love with it's a a greek concept it's kind of a a mask it's, it's like a masculine heroic energy but it's called thumos mm. and it's the the image is pulling i call it pulling with both horses you know a black horse and a white horse but really you know the idea is that the hero is not just the benevolent savior the hero is obviously not just the the cruel you know punisher and you know sword swinger but it is the the combination of really pulling with both horses in what um you know maybe Jung would call like you know having like doing that shadow work and being aware of both sides of yourself mm -hmm. 
And one of the things that you mentioned several times during this conversation is, you know, like, oh, I'm a witch and, and the, oh, yeah. the witch you practice for my Christian friends and people, you know, I don't want you to get thrown off by that. The, especially the archetype of the witch is such an important one. Yeah. It's one of the few female archetypes that, uh, is like, doesn't get their source of power from a male, right? Like mm -hmm. the witch is a self-contained mm -hmm. unit. It's not like the princess that needs saving from the prince or, and it, so it's a, it's a very important Part. Absolutely. Well, also, yeah. this might blow your mind, too, but there are Christian witches. Oh, I have no doubt. You know, they're... Honestly, it's this, It's the thing of the deity, right? It's like, when I, when I left the woods after praying, you know, in the woods and, and, and you know, hugging trees and all that other kind of stuff, one of the things that came to me was to pray to this Jesus archetype, right? Because I had a lot of anger as a child towards that name, you know? And of course I was super resistant. I was like in my mind having this conversation with, with, I don't know if it was myself or some higher power. I do believe it was a higher power. And I was like, there's no way in hell I'm going to pray to this Jesus name thing. Like no freaking way. Right. But I was so desperate that I believe what was spoken to me about doing that in order to get over the sort of the, the um, stigmatism. Is that a word? Yeah. Yeah, so it's sort of the, 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 the stigma, the stigma that I put on that. Right. Um, and so I did. And it wasn't like that I had to pray for, for a long time to it. It's just until I got over all of the stigma that I put on it. Right. Um, and I did. And then I stopped. And it was only because for me personally, it was only because um, I have no quorum with the the word or the name I have more quorum with those certain people who use that name in order to access as a club a higher you know a higher level of spiritual consciousness oh okay, okay you know what I mean but that name could be anything right it's not the name itself it's what it's the belief you put behind it right it's the it's the devotion you put behind it and that could be rose you know what I mean? You can say the word rose and mean the same thing as those who say the word Jesus, right? It's like, so, I mean, I don't want to get controversial, but that's just kind of where I'm at personally with it. So I like the, like the word God, it's a three letter word that has so many different attributes yeah. to it. Right. Um, so, so me, me on my spiritual journey in order for me to grow spiritually, I have to be open to the many different avenues of what that looks like. I mean, it can be, you know, it can be, um, there's a, there's this guy, this amazing, amazing, amazing guy by the name of Astarius Miraculi. And he's, he's a, he's a, a beautiful black man who's, um, who's a, he's a Reiki, Reiki healer. He's a, evocationist he's a didgeridoo player which i play the didgeridoo too and he also is a rapper and he does sound healing and he did this 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 song called spirit rap and and it's one of the first things that really really blew open my mind um um when i in my sobriety you know um and he speaks to um all the different many names that um, this higher level of, of consciousness can represent. But it also, it all comes down to as a, as a, as a group, is it a positive and creative Avenue or is it a negative, a negative and destructive Avenue? Because if it's positive and creative and it's backed by love, then it's everything, isn't it? no matter what the name is, but if it's negative instructive and it's backed by hate, then that's a, a whole different thing. Right. But you know how in witchcraft, I don't know. I don't want to go to witchcraft. They do talk about 
it's neither dark nor light. It's both because nature is both, right? In order to have the light, you need the dark. So I, 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 I love that you mentioned that because I wasn't really thinking about, you know, Christians might, you know, might, um, being offended by me talking about being a witch. Yeah. I, but it, I think it's important for me to also say that there is a lot of my personality that is Christian and a witch. Yeah. Know, without, but it's also a lot of Buddhism in there too. So, yeah, it's not so much the, you know, Christians that would get a, offended because I, I, you know, I know that there will be people that just hear a word and, and tune out, but it's more to just keep people engaged in the conversation, you know, mm -hmm. because, um, my friend's been church shopping, so I've been going to church with him mm, yes. and I follow the rules. I don't take communion because they, you know, the few churches that we've gone to kind of, you know, they asked, Hey, if, you know, Jesus is not mm. the Lord and savior, don't take the communion. And I said, mm. oh, you know, okay. But, um, I have just enjoyed watching how other people commune with the sacred, mm -hmm. you know, and like the ability to, to have things that are sacred in this world and, um, to enjoy them and, and keep them sacred is, is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And every single, you know, I've heard a religion is a set of beliefs, precepts, and practices that people share, Yeah, you know? And so I, I enjoy watching how other people commune with the, mm -hmm. the sacred. So it's more just to say, Hey, keep listening mm -hmm. uh, rather than, you know, if they're, deeply offended They're, they might go and I can't stop them, but, <laughs> <laughs> but just say, Hey, keep listening. You know, there's, there's a lot here. And I, I see the idea of exploring your, exploring the world of magic as a really healing place mm. and as a place to go, what are the bounds of my power in this world? Mm. And what am I responsible for? You know, I, I, I think that the words we speak are magic. Oh, absolutely. Right. We just got done reading the four agreements in our book club. And, you know, one of the first things it brings up is, hey, you know, if your mom told you to shut up and that your voice was terrible mm -hmm. and you ended up believing that the rest of your life, that's magic. Mm -hmm. That was a spell put upon you because yeah. you, you end up agreeing with that. And now that's a deep part of your belief system. Yeah. So, you know, I... You know, it's funny to, it's funny, it's still funny for me to use the word magic, but in a, in a lot of ways, it's like, I am exploring the magical world. I think everybody is. And like, what are the bounds of my influence? How can I use my speech, my words, and just my presence, you know, mm -hmm. what you might call your, your like psychic presence to influence, you know, to be a positive influence on my son mm -hmm. and my community and my friends or friends and coworkers. And so what does that process look like for you? Cause I have seen you face pretty big challenges. I've seen you face the, the ends of very long relationships mm -hmm. that were, you know, essentially at that point, a separation of a part of yourself, mm -hmm. seeing you do big moves, big career shifts. Mm -hmm. And I've seen you really rise to these occasions from the outside, looking in very gracefully. Mm. But I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you prepare for the next leg of the journey, about how you harness the resources within you magically or ritually mm -hmm. and how well, you know, I do. I do a lot of um, I do a lot of journaling. I have just hundreds of journals, you know, from before I got sober um, until now. I do a lot of that. I do a lot of um, talking. I like to say talking it out instead of thinking it in. Because when you talk it out, you get it out. You know, when you think it in, it stays in there where the problem is going, <laughs> where the problem is centered. <laughs> um, I do a lot of that. Um, and Talking it out instead of thinking it in. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I do a lot of that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I do a lot of pausing when agitated. But, you know, I also rock climb. And that's another, for me, being physical is another form of release, you know. Um, but sitting, sitting with my, sitting, you know, 
sitting at home or on the balcony or on the beach or whatever, just sitting for a moment, pausing for a moment and just experiencing what's actually happening, just allowing myself to experience the natural flow of what the things that's going around me, that really takes me, that just sort of redirects all of that, that energy. Like I said, I don't really know what tomorrow is going to bring. Yeah. You know? I, and, I, and I honestly, at this point in my life, I don't really want to know. I don't want to guess anymore. You know, because there is so much energy in guessing. And nine times out of 10, the thing that I get, it doesn't even happen the way I guessed it would. You know what I mean? Um, there, it, It's going to happen the way it's going to happen anyway, you know. And maybe that's aloof or maybe that's very, you know, nonchalant. But so be it. Like, I'd rather not miss my opportunity to be of service and to be present and to experience like just the natural flow of life right now by focusing on the what might be's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because that's not what is, you know, what is is what's real and why not experience and explore and ex surrender to what is like, what's so wrong with what is I am. I am a part of what is, so I might as well just accept that. And I, and I love doing, I love getting, reminding myself to just accept and surrender to the moment as it is, you know? Yeah. And there's so much power in that. There's so much power in that. But. So walk, walk me through a little bit of Cryolon's creative process. Kind of from start to finish. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a scenario. Okay, give me a scenario. <laughs> you got a, a big opportunity coming up. You got to produce a big look. It's maybe the most well-known uh, fashion designer or the <laughs> biggest film that you're creating a look for. And you really want to put Krylon out there, which I've seen you do mm -hmm. multiple times. But uh, I just want to, if you could just invite us a little bit into the that inner world of, of from like from the morning to the harnessing your your energy getting your mind right creatively figuring out what like just t take us through you know all the witchy ritual and all i want to just get a mm. glimpse of what the process is well you know if i was to create a scenario yeah. <laughs> um every single morning i wake up the first thing i do is make my bed <laughs> yeah me too i absolutely love doing that and then i go into a sitting in front of my altar because I have an altar there and I'll light some Palo Santo or some sort of like, you know, incense or whatever, some sage or whatever. And I'll go into meditation and I'll ask my higher God. I'll just use the word God. I'll ask God to redirect my thinking to where it would have me be. And then I'm right. Then I'm reminded when I do that, that I'm right where my God would have me be or I wouldn't be where I'm at. So that brings me back to where I am, right? And then I asked the, this, my God to show me the next right indicated action um, and to remove the fear, right? Because everything, like there's so much anticipation with things like that. There's like, I hope I do well. I hope people like it. I hope that, hope, hope you know, it's like, I hope that, it blows people away that it inspires some people that I'm not a laughing stock or whatever. Right. And I asked for all of that to be removed because, you know, there's that fear is false evidence appearing real mm -hmm. F E A R or what do they fuck everything and run? Yeah. <laughs> but I like the face everything and rise part, you know? So facing those fears showing up no matter what, um, doing the contrary action, right? Like everything wants me to hide and just or call people and like, ah, it's over, I'm like, it's off, I don't want to do it. But instead I show up with what I got and, um, and believe that what I got is what, I, what they want or they wouldn't ask me for it. I mean, sometimes I pull a, a tarot card to her net, like every full moon I do that, you know what I mean? Every new, not full moon, every new moon I pull it. I pull for tarot. reflection for reflection yeah that's you know. how i use them too is i'll think about the concept behind the card mm -hmm. i don't think there's something mystical in the card me personally yeah you might it's a that's physical a, thing that's okay yeah. but i look at it i look at the image and i just let it kind of be almost be like a rorschach like what does this bring up for me 
Yeah. What is this? You know, it's almost like a, a writing prompt or a meditation prompt. Uh-huh. Otherwise, it, they just get too scary for me. So I'm like, oh no, the hangman, <laughs> the burning tower, <laughs> you know, no. the tower, or the tower. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. So, I don't put too much faith in the cards, obviously, yeah. you know, because um, they're just cards. But I do always ask God to inspire me through the cards. Yeah. You know, I always bring some, you know, my God into everything, right? It has to be into everything or it's either it is or it isn't, right? It's either everything or nothing at all. That includes the cards. So I get that kind of another form of direction or another f- form of inspiration just through the cards. And then I'll look at them and it helps me to take action more towards acceptance of what's to come rather than trying to divert myself from experiencing what's to come. You know what I mean? Um, and it's allowing it to be what it is, what lessons I need. Right. If it's like, if you open up a book, you don't like skip to like chapter five, when you're just at chapter one, you're missing an entire fucking story. You know, um, I would love to know what's going to happen to Tracy who just got, you know, kicked off the cheerleading team or whatever, but um, I have to read up to that point and find out, well, she deserved it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that whole thing. So um, yeah, that, so my process is, is, you know, is to just m- go into, into the situation mellow. And then when I'm there, I do, if I, if I'm overwhelmed I'll go into the bathroom and I'll, you know, I'll pause because I'm agitated and um, I'll ask my God again to, you know, remove my thinking and direct my focus to where it'll have me be. And I'm like, I can show up again with what I got Um, because it's, it, that it always, when it starts with a thought and I follow it to a feeling, if I'm in a feeling, it started with a thought, right? Yeah. And if the thoughts where the problem is centered and I'm in a feeling that started with a thought, then I'm allowing the problem to dictate my personal reality. Right. You want to know what one of my post-its on my uh, wall right now is it says I acted better than I thought or felt. That's so good. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. (laughs) Isn't that a good one? You can steal it. I'm going to steal that one. (laughs) I acted better than I thought or felt. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's that, there's that being, um, conscious of whether or not the feeling I'm feeling was based in a simple thought or is it some random intuition thing? You know what I mean? Because even if it is intuition, it's not like I can control that. Right. It's this whole thing of like, Oh, you know, I, I, I have in my gut that I should, you know, do something that something in my gut tells me to do something. Right. And it's like, if, you're, if that's something in your gut tells you to do something, there's either you're trying to control the something that your gut's telling you to do, or you're already on the road to fulfilling what your gut has told you to do, right? So it's kind of like, I'd rather just be on the road than trying to control it, you know? Yeah. Um, and, um, and I'll wind up where I'm supposed to be, doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, you know? So that's that. Um, do I get angry and upset and pissed? Oh, yes. Oh, 1000%, you know, because I don't do anything perfectly, but I don't believe perfection is a requirement for living. You know, I think, I think we claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Yes, (laughs) we try. We try, which just tells me that the the change is going to continue to happen on the journey and at some random destination that my brain perceives to be right it's just i gotta stay on this journey one day one step one breath at a time to the best of my ability yeah where is the best place to to follow your works and your creations or if people want to get in contact with you okay well i have two bands that i'm in one is double duchess um, and there is a website www.doubleduchess d-u-c-h-e-s-s so it's Double D O U B L E D U C H E S S um, dot com, and that's more dancey, sort of housey, booty bouncing music. <laughs> then I have another band, 
that I'm in with um, a really, a couple of really, well, it's three trans girls. One is Drew from Trap Girl, which is a punk band. The other is Honey Mahogany, who's actually running for um, for a seat in San Francisco. Okay. Um, and um, she was on RuPaul's Drag Race. And then, and then there's me. And that band's called Commando, and it's heavy metal. <laughs> so there's that. And then um, my Instagram is at Krylon Superstar. And on my Instagram, there is a link to my um, what I do professionally as a hairstylist, which is at Cry Cuts. And it has all of the Looks. stuff that I do there. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Would you lead us out with a... Uh a prayer uh, or intention or pep talk for, you know, that we could maybe clip out and I'll, I'll play it as we go on our artistic journeys to stay true to our art and to make, to make it not to just let it sit up here, but to actually produce it. And would you lead us out with a, a Krylon prayer? A Krylon, like an actual Krylon prayer. An actual Krylon <laughs> prayer. Uh, yeah. On my phone, in my and on my phone, I have notes and I have tons and tons of notes. And one of the prayers that I give to all of the people that I am um, spiritually advising, <laughs> I give them this. Do you want to read it? Yeah. Yeah, go okay? grab it. Yeah. First, before before we do that. Okay. I before we do that, there is this thing that this that I that I don't know. It, it came up. I don't know if I said this or I read this somewhere, but it came up on my Facebook memories, and I was like, "Oh my god!" And it's talking specifically about the whole Christianity thing, and it said, "God is not a Christian. God is not a Jew or a Muslim or a Hindi or a Buddhist. All those are human systems." which human beings have created to try to help us walk into a, the mystery of God. I honor my tradition. I walk through my tradition, but I don't think my tradition defines God. It only points me to God. Oh, I love that. I thought that was so powerful. I thought that was so powerful. I just needed to say that. But this is the one that, um, okay. It's not, it's, it's kind of a prayer, but I, 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 I posted it for all of my people that I spiritually advise. <laughs> <laughs> So, when I wake in the morning and I hear the traffic outside or the birds flying around or airplanes overhead or children laughing and playing, I pause and listen close and say, and then say, God, thank, oh, thank you, God, I hear you, and this is the evidence. And when I'm walking around throughout the day and a butterfly comes randomly out of nowhere or walks or walk past a rose bush or when I, a person helps out a person in need without expectations, I can pause and say, thank you, God, I see you, and this is the evidence. And when I'm sitting on the beach and, and behold a sunset, or when I'm hanging with dear friends and we laugh uncontrollably, I can pause and say, thank you, God, I feel you, and this is the evidence. Where was I at, what I went through, and what I'm experiencing now? So that's, that's what I... That's what I got. I hope that's okay. That's more than okay. Thank you, Krylon. Thank you for your time and for coming and for being a friend all these years. Thank you for being a friend. This was fun. Yeah. This is really fun to be able to We can do it again. With you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of the How To Human Podcast. If you felt it, if you felt a little bit of that magic, please remember to go share it with other people. Please remember to go love freely and openly to view the world in a loving way because this world needs you so badly. If you would like to join our community or if you would like to send us some love, you could do that by going to patreon.com slash howtohuman. I would love your presence, your wisdom, and your contribution. For more of us, you could go to www.hellohumans.co. Thanks and have a great day.